Good morning. My name is Allie June. Today's scripture is Matthew twenty three twelve. For those who who exalt themselves will will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. The scriptures are as relevant today as they were then. Nice job, Allie June. She's pretty precious, if I do say so myself. Well, good morning, church family. It is such an honor to be able to share the message with you guys today. I always consider this a great privilege any time that I get to teach, but I think especially this week, it feels like an even greater privilege after our 24 hours of prayer that we had this past week. Uh, If you don't know about that, uh, many of you in this congregation, we joined together, we united, and we sought the Lord together for 24 hours straight. And I just think there is such power in that, power in God's people joining together to do that. So I think as we came in this morning, after spending that intentional time with the Lord, we come in with our cups full, and I'm excited to do what the Lord is going to do. As always, I'm excited to see what the Lord is going to do. That's what I meant there. As always, anytime I stand up here, it is in willing, wholehearted submission to Dallas and to our elders here, one of which is my own husband. I am so thankful for our church leadership. Y'all, it is easy to want to submit to them. It is a joy to get to submit to them. And I'm so humbled that you guys would give me the opportunity uh, to share this morning. Humbled. I can make that statement with more clarity this morning because I've been studying about humility all week this week. And that's actually what we're going to be talking about this morning. I'm titling today's message, Get Lower. Get Lower. And my, oh my, has the Lord been showing me how much I need to do that in my own life this week. Humility unfortunately, doesn't come very naturally to me. Maybe some of you in here can relate. I remember when Matt and I had our first daughter, Ava. She's 11 now, but when she was born, y'all, she was just the most precious thing you have ever seen, and she was such a good baby. Some of you can attest to that fact because you knew her then. She was such a good baby. She, she slept through the night at just a few weeks old. She, she rarely cried. She ate so good. As she started to grow up, she just obeyed us. The majority of the time, now she wasn't perfect, of course, but she felt like she was pretty close. And I remember thinking, man, I have nailed this mom thing. Like, I have whipped this kid into shape. Somebody get me a mom of the year trophy because all those books I've read about motherhood, they have paid off. Clearly, I'm a maternal genius. And then we had Allie June. And I quickly realized that Ava's behavior had a lot more to do with Ava's temperament than with my dominant motherhood skills. Um, I did the same things with Allie June that I did with Ava, but she didn't sleep through the night for months and months and months. During her toddler years, we did the walk of shame out of more restaurants in Johnson City than you would believe. Some of you parents of toddlers, you know what I'm talking about right now. I'm still nervous to go back in some of those places because of the scenes that Allie June used to cause. Now, I can say this about her now because, as you saw, she is precious as she can be. And glory to God, at about age of four, she started to grow out of that that stage. Um, And now she is so sweet and precious and well-behaved. But there was a time... When Matt and I did not know if we were going to survive the first three years of Allie June's life, it was a very humbling experience to realize I am not the greatest mom of all time. Life has a way of humbling us sometimes, doesn't it? The Lord, he has a way of humbling us sometimes. He knows we need that. He knows that keeps our focus on him and not on ourselves. The verse that Allie June so quietly and meekly read was Matthew 23, 12. And it assures us that for those who exalt themselves, they will be humbled. But those who humble themselves will be exalted. My friend Morgan, she makes verselets 
and she made a verselet with this verse on it, and it's one that I wear all the time because, y'all, I need this reminder. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. If the Bible says it, we can count on it. Amen? So it turns out I'm not the greatest mom of all time, not even close. But this morning, I do want to talk to you about a man who Jesus himself did call the greatest. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus said this. He said, among those born of women, there has never been anyone greater than a man named John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a man who embodied humility to the fullest extent. He knew how to get lower and lower and lower. And because of his humility, Jesus exalts him. Jesus declares him publicly to be the greatest. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. Case in point. So what we're going to do this morning is I want us to take a look at some of the events in John's life that Scripture recounts. And I want us to study what characteristics John had that produced in him this deep humility. And then we're going to take a look at the resulting fruit of John's humility. That's our game plan this morning. Y'all good with that? Can you give me a head nod? That's our plan. And we're doing this all with the goal in mind of learning how to get lower ourselves. But before we jump into scripture, can we go to the Lord in prayer just one more time and ask him to help us do that this morning? Father, we need you this morning. This is a tough one, Lord. God, I pray, Holy Spirit, that your your presence would be here with us as your word goes forth, that you would move forth in power in our hearts, God, that you would begin to do this work inside of us that we cannot do ourselves, God. Jesus, I thank you that you are the ultimate example of humility. May we follow hard after you. God, I need you now. Stay with us this morning. And we ask all these things in the name and in the power of Jesus. Amen. You all can go ahead and turn with me in your Bible or on your device to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. In just a few moments, we're going to read verses 19 through 28 of John chapter 1. But before we jump in, a little background information about John the Baptist in case you're new to the church scene. If you're new to the church scene, man, we're so glad you're here. But John the Baptist, he was actually a cousin of Jesus. He was born into a priestly family from the tribe of Levi. And he was given a mission from God himself. And his mission was to prepare the way for the Messiah to tell the people, hey, get ready. Look, he's coming. He's here. Prepare the way for the Lord. He preached a message of repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, John... He was an odd dude, okay? He really was. He lived out in the middle of nowhere in the wilderness. He ate bugs. He wore animal skin. He was really odd. But the Holy Spirit's anointing on him must have been something powerful because despite all those oddities, the people still flocked to John. They came to him to hear this message of repentance that he preached. They wanted to be baptized by John. He was causing a scene. He was causing a stir, so much so that the religious authorities of that day, they wanted to find out more about this John the Baptist guy. They had some questions for him. They wanted to see about his influence, and that is where we're going to pick up in Scripture together this morning. John chapter 1, verses 19 through 28. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah, the prophet. I love this. Listen to this. He says, I am the voice. I am the voice of one calling in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord. Now some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, why then do you baptize? If you're not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet, I baptize with water, John replied. But among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me. 
the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. Y'all, I have been to that Jordan River. I have put my feet down in it and just makes this story so real to me. But can you see the humility of John the Baptist? It's already evident just in this initial passage. One characteristic I want to point out this morning that I believe contributed to John's humility is that John, he knew who he wasn't. Y'all, humble people, number one, know who they are not. Humble people know who they are not. We can tell by the context clues in this passage that rumors have been spreading about who John is, right? The first thing that he actually has to deny being is the, the actual Messiah himself. I mean, these would have been some really flattering rumors that are spreading about John, right? But he says he freely confesses, I'm not, I'm not the Messiah. I am not the Christ. So then they're like, well, are you Elijah? Are you Elijah? Now, there was an Old Testament prophecy in Malachi that at the time people held to literally that said Elijah would return before the Messiah came. So they're like, are you him? Well, at John's announcement of his birth, an angel did declare that, that John the Baptist would go about his ministry in the spirit and power of Elijah. And there was a lot of similarities between John the Baptist and Elijah, but John the Baptist didn't even feel the need to point all that out. He didn't even feel the need to draw attention to all that. He's like, I'm not Elijah. Well, they ask him, are you the prophet? Are you the prophet that Moses talks about in Deuteronomy, the one that would come during Jesus' lifetime? Are you him? John's like, no. No, I'm not him either. Now, go ahead. Admit it. How many of us in this room would have been tempted to be like, well, I mean, you said it. Not, not me. I mean, if, if they think I'm this great prophet Elijah, we're really, we got a lot in common. Maybe I am. What's the harm, you know, and letting them just think that. Maybe, I'll, maybe they'll listen to this message that I have to tell them. It's really important. If they think that I'm someone great, they're going to listen better. Something like that ever happened to you? Maybe, maybe someone's given you more credit than you deserve, and instead of setting the record straight, you're like, oh, what's the harm? We'll just let them, we'll just let them think that, you know. Trust me, eventually that facade, it gets too heavy to carry. John knew who he was not. Humility gives us the freedom and takes the pressure off of us to try to be something that we are not. Humility releases this nagging, self-defeating desire to always need attention and spotlight and notoriety and recognition. Needing those things constantly, y'all. What it does is it results in continual disappointment and discontentment. Those desires come from pride, and a heart that is filled with pride is actually a, a sick and unhealthy heart. I've had an injured shoulder for a few months now. I injured it a couple years ago, actually, and I think I just never really let it fully heal. And then a few months ago at the gym, I, I injured it again, and I felt like it was pretty bad this time. And can I tell you, for weeks, I thought about my shoulder so much. I mean, it hurt with every move I made. If I reached for something, it would hurt, and I thought about it. If I was asleep and just rolled over to this side, not aware of what I was doing, I would wake up because it hurt. I would think about it. It took up so much of my attention because injured things require a lot more attention than healthy things. Y'all, injured people require a lot more attention than healthy people, right? People who are overridden with pride and the desire or need for recognition, they just carry with them this constant need to always have attention. Healthy people with humble hearts, they're free of that burden. They don't need that. John was free of that burden. He knew who he wasn't, and he was good with that. But John also knew who he was. He knew who he was because humble people, number two, they also know who they are. They know who they're not, but they know who they are. Sometimes I think we confuse humility with low self-esteem. Y'all, those two things are not the same. Not the same at all. Thinking too highly of yourself or thinking too lowly of yourself 
are both the result of pride. Humble people have a correct and healthy view of themselves. Humble followers of Jesus, y'all, they know that they are made in the image of God. They know that God has gifted them with gifts and abilities that they can use in service to him. And they believe they have faith that God will enable them to use those gifts and abilities. They know that they are dearly loved and highly favored. But because they know those things, they are freed from the need to always be focusing on themselves. There's no outward injury there soaking up all their attention. So they're able to direct their focus from being inward to outward. C.S. Lewis, he says this. He says, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking about yourself less. John, he embodied that kind of humility. He knew who he was, and he knew who he wasn't. So when they pressure him, and they're like, okay, John, tell us. If you're not Elijah, and you're not the prophet, and you're not the Christ, who are you, John? And I love his response. He says, I am a voice. A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. Do you know what's so cool about a voice? A voice can't even be seen, can it? A voice isn't even necessarily supposed to be seen. It's meant to be heard, but a voice can be a very, very powerful thing. John's like, don't put that spotlight on me. Don't look at me. I'm just a voice. His humility allowed him to make his focus what his focus needed to be, and that was on the Messiah. That was on his mission. It wasn't on himself. Some of us, myself included, we need to realize that our mission, it is the same as John's, y'all. We are called to be a voice. We're not necessarily meant to be seen all the time, but to be heard because a voice is a powerful thing. But a lot of times we are so consumed with being seen with looking good, with gaining status, more Instagram likes, more notoriety. And those desires, I'm telling you, they are like bleeding wounds to our souls. Soaking up more and more of our attention, focusing our eyes more and more on ourselves. We were never meant to be seen that often in the first place. We're meant to be heard with a voice saying, get ready, make way for the Lord. John knew who he was, he knew who he wasn't, and that enabled him to keep his focus on what his focus needed to be. Y'all, when we know who we are, but when we know who we're not, that will enable us to keep our focus on what our focus needs to be. We've just previously, here at Grace Meadows, went through a series on worship on Sunday mornings. And it's been so good. We've had several people teach during that series. And we talked a lot about worshiping the Lord with your whole heart. We talked about not letting influences into our lives that divide our hearts away from the Lord. But my fear is that the main thing that divides our hearts away from the Lord is ourselves. We are, are sometimes the thing that competes the most for our worship. We bow down to this idol of ourselves as every day we wake up and we chase after what will make us the most happy. What will make us the most fulfilled? What will bring us the most temporary satisfaction? That is what we choose to bow down to. That, I think, a lot of times is the biggest competition that we have for our worship. John the Baptist, he had the right view of himself. And it would have been so easy for John the Baptist to have become self-absorbed. I mean, think about it. People were coming from all over to hear him preach. He was baptizing people by the boatloads. And yet he knew. He knew who he was. He knew who he was. And that enabled him to be like, look, there's somebody else coming that you need to look to. It's not me. There's one coming who's sandal strap. I'm not even worthy to untie. That was the job of just a common slave, a common servant. John knew how to get lower. He knew how to get lower. Dallas. Dallas also knows how to get lower. Um... Do you know why people like me get to speak at our church? People like Justin, people like Steve. It's because Dallas has no interest building a church that is all about him. 
It's all about himself. He's literally said in our staff meetings, if something happens to me, if I, if I fail in some way, if, if something happens to my health, I don't want the church to be focused all on me. I don't want it to be about me. It's got to be about the Lord. I don't want people coming just, just to hear me. I want them to come to hear from the Lord. So in his humility, he allows others to come and to speak. He trains up leaders because he realizes who he is and who he isn't, that yes, he is called to this. So he doesn't he doesn't walk shyly away from that. He doesn't walk worried that he can't fill these shoes. He walks confidently in that. But he also knows who he isn't, that he isn't what all of this is about. And so he is willing to let others step up and serve for the good of God's church. He knows who he is, and he knows who he isn't. Let's skip over to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verses 22 through 30. We're going to read another account from the Gospel of John about John the Baptist. If you're new to church life, these are two different Johns. The Gospel of John is written by the disciple John, believed to have been, and he's writing about John the Baptist. Verse 22 through 30, it says this. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside, where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim, because there was plenty of water, and people were constantly coming to be baptized. Pay attention to that. Verse 24, this was before John was put into prison. We're also going to come back to that. Verse 25, an angel, an argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. And they came to John, and they said to him, "Uh, Rabbi? That man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, well, he is baptizing, and now everyone is going to him. To this, John replied, a man can receive only what is given to him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits And listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine. It is now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. Some translations say he must increase. I must decrease. Y'all, that is a powerful word to live your life by. John had this humility thing pretty figured out. But his disciples, they do not. They're like, Rabbi, do you see what's happening? You were here first, and now that guy Jesus, the one you were talking about, he's setting up shop right next door. And, and now everybody's going to him. What should we do? Should we run some kind of baptism special, a two-for-one baptism? Should we, should we ramp up our marketing campaign, put out a Facebook ad? John, what are we going to do? John's like, no. No, I've been telling you this all along. He's the focus. I'm not the focus. John even sent some of his own disciples to follow Jesus. He's like, this is not it. This is not what it's about, guys. John the Baptist wasn't about to get caught up into some kind of comparison trap with Jesus. Because humble people, number three, they don't get caught up in comparison traps. They just don't. John the Baptist is like, really, guys? Really? No one can receive anything unless the Father gives it to him. Some of us today, we get so caught up in these exact same things, y'all. And thanks to social media, what everyone has and what everyone does is blasted right in front of our faces. And it's so easy to, to begin to feel slighted or sad, or, or offended that we don't have what someone else has, or that we don't get to do what someone else gets to do. Look, it is all grace. That's what John's saying to them. It's all grace. What, what you have, what I have, what other people have, it is all grace. Our Father knows how to give good gifts to all of his children. It's all grace. But when those feelings of jealousy or insecurity begin to get triggered, we start to do exactly what those disciples were doing. We start spiraling, right? They're like, Jesus, what are we going to do? Everybody's going to, they're like, John, what are we going to do? Everybody's going to Jesus now. 
gospel just three verses earlier, we just read that plenty of people were still coming to John to be baptized too. But when those feelings start to rise in us, we start to not look at the truth of situations. We start to to look at them in a, in a, a weird view where we cannot see our own blessings. All we see is a certain lack that is not really there. We start spiraling. I encourage you, when you are triggered by something that causes you to begin to feel insecure, that causes you to begin to compare yourself or your life to other people, stop. Just take a minute. Look at your own life. Look at the grace that God has extended to you. And then look at the grace that he has extended towards other people. Take a moment to realize that all of that is from him. And that will give you a moment to step out of that tangled web of comparison. And instead of being envious or jealous, you will actually be able to celebrate the good things in your own life and the good things in other people's lives. Comparison does one of two things. Comparison either makes us think too highly of ourselves or too negatively of ourselves. And neither one of those things bring glory to God. Both of those options are rooted in pride. John's not worried about how he measures up next to Jesus. There was no inferiority complex in John. John's like, I'm not the groom. I'm not the groom. I'm the best man. And I realize that this is a savior, savee kind of relationship, but I want to be a friend like John. One that says, look, I'm the best man. I am cheering him on. When, When he gets what God has for him, hallelujah, my joy is made complete. I want to be that kind of friend. I want to be that kind of wife. I want to be that kind of daughter who is just a cheerleader championing on other people. That is who John was. John knew how to get lower and lower. His focus was on his mission, on his Messiah, and not on himself. So he says, look, he must increase. I've got to decrease. Those were the last words that the Gospel of John records John the Baptist saying. But we know from other books in the Bible that John continued to live out this motto for the rest of his life. He must become greater. I must become less. He must increase. I must decrease. John the Baptist would eventually be imprisoned and then ultimately beheaded for his Savior. Y'all, there are no links that John would not go for Jesus because humble people, lastly, they go to great links for other people. Humble people go to great links for others. And I want to add, humble followers of Jesus, they go to great links for their Savior. The suffering that John ends up enduring in his final years, it was great. It was great, but humility allowed John to endure suffering righteously. I want to be clear. John was, John was an incredibly humble man, but John was still a man. And his pathway to humility was not perfect. He even had his doubts at times later on when he is actually imprisoned, probably in torturous conditions. Luke chapter 7 records that John has some questions. Because if you've ever been through a time of suffering, then you know what John was going through. You understand. You will start to have some questions, likely. John had some questions. So he sends two of his disciples to go to Jesus and he's like, look, I want you to ask Jesus, are you really the one? Are you, are you really the Messiah that we've been waiting for, Jesus, or should we look for somebody else? This was John the Baptist. Even he had his questions at times in the midst of suffering. He was probably thinking, why, Jesus, am I here in these chains? Why am I not living this victorious life as your prophet and forerunner? If you're the one, why haven't you set up your reign yet? Jesus, why aren't you doing anything yet? I don't deserve this. I wonder if he was thinking that. I probably would have been. I don't deserve this. I've been doing exactly what God asked me to do. So John's disciples, they take these questions to Jesus. And Jesus, who had every right to be like, instead he meets those questions with such tenderness and with such compassion. Because he knows that John is in a place of suffering. 
And when you are in a place of suffering, Jesus, he will always meet you there with such great compassion, even when you bring these kind of hard questions to him. And so he tells John's disciples, look, I want you to go back to John, and I want you to report this. And this will seem odd at first, but he says, I want you to tell John, hey, the blind are receiving sight. The lame walk, the deaf hear, the leper is cleansed, the dead are raised, and the poor are hearing the good news. Y'all, that was all prophecies that were supposed to be fulfilled about the Messiah. So what John is saying is, hey, I'm doing it. Hey, I'm doing it. But then he tells him, the last thing I want you to tell John is this. Tell him, blessed is he who isn't offended by me. Blessed is he who isn't offended by me. So first he assures them that, hey, John, I am who you know that I am. I know your faith is low right now because you are in a season of suffering, but John, you know that I, who I am, and I am he. I am the one you've been heralding. I'm the one who's performing all these miracles that, that have been prophesied that the Messiah would do. He gives him a reason to hope. He encourages his faith, but then he acknowledges, hey, John, I realize that this doesn't look how you expected it to look. Don't be offended by that. Don't hold on to how you think things should be so tightly that whenever I don't do them the way you think that I should be doing them, that you're offended by that, John. He's encouraging John's faith that, look, even if my work doesn't look like you think it should, I'm still working. I'm still working, y'all. Humility allows us to withstand suffering righteously. Maybe right now in your own life, you've been in a time of suffering Maybe you're in a time of suffering right now and you've been praying that God would handle that situation the way you think that it needs to be handled. And he hasn't. Or he didn't. And that pride has caused a wall to come up between you and the Lord and you feel like you can't trust him anymore. If that's you today, I want you to know that just because his work doesn't look how you think it should does not mean that he is not working. And blessed is he who isn't offended by that. Blessed is he who knows that his ways are higher than our ways. He must increase. Y'all, we got to decrease. Maybe in your marriage right now, you've been praying that God would heal your marriage. You've been praying, Lord, fix it. God, fix it. But the means by which he wants to fix it is by you learning how to get lower, by you letting go of offenses, by you serving when you feel like your spouse should be serving you for once, by you forgiving over and over again, continuing to get lower and lower and lower. Maybe it's your boss at work, the one that just doesn't appreciate you very much, that is making life harder for you, but desperately needs to see Jesus in your life because he doesn't have Jesus in his. And so the Lord beckons you, come on, get lower. Come on, get lower. Keep your focus on what the focus needs to be. Persevere in this. Get lower. Get lower. I realize that these are very hard things to do in the moment. Matt and I, we are we're foster parents. And there are a lot of times throughout this journey where sometimes a birth parent will, will do things or say things or make decisions that, that you don't understand. And, and I'm like, I would never do that. How could they make that choice? I would never be in that situation. I would never do that. And you know what I hear the Lord saying to me every single time? Come on, Tara, get lower. Come on, get lower because yes, you would. If you were raised the same way that they were raised, you would be right in that gutter with them. If, you, if I stripped all the gracious means that I have blessed you with, you're likely to be right there with them. Come on, Tara, get lower. Stay focused. Keep your focus on what the focus needs to be. Get lower. Be the voice that I need you to be in that situation. He calls us to be that voice. Worship team, you all can come as we close. So often, y'all, Jesus beckons us with that invitation to get lower. But Jesus, y'all, he is so good because he doesn't just stop there. He doesn't just stop with that invitation. All right, Dallas, come on, get lower. Mo Morgan, let's get lower. Hannah, let's, let's get lower. He doesn't just stop there by telling us to do it. <clears throat> Y'all, he has shown us how to do it. 
He has shown us how to do it. As much humility as John the Baptist had, y'all, it pales in comparison to the humility of Jesus. When I was in Israel, we walked along that Via Dolorosa, the pathway that Jesus had to carry his cross to Calvary. Walking every step, carrying his cross, his blood pouring out for you and for me, making the conscious decision every step of the way to get lower and lower and lower. Y'all, he displayed a humility that you and I cannot even fathom. So in your life, in situations where God is asking you to humble yourself, it's a hard thing to do, but keep your eye on the one who showed us how to do it in the first place. And remember, those who humble themselves will be exalted. And that goes for Jesus too, y'all. He is already seated at the right hand of the Father in exaltation. But there is a day coming when we will see that exaltation face to face. Amen. But for the time being, our mission is the same as John's. We are called to be a voice. A powerful voice in this wilderness that we live in declaring, get ready. Get ready because the Lord is coming. And once we tear down this idol of self that we have built up, we will be able to focus on that mission so much greater as we decrease and he increases. When that happens, there will be no distance or depth that we will not go for our Savior. There will be no suffering that is too much, no sacrifice that is too great, no person that is too far gone for us to love. But the first step of humility is realizing that you need it. It's realizing that you need more of it. So if you're here today and you're like, man, I didn't even know. I didn't even realize that this pride had built up in my life and and I see it now. If if that's you, that's a really, really great place to be because prideful people don't even realize that they have a need for humility. So if you realize it, that's a great place to start. And if this message was for nobody else but myself, then hallelujah. Because forgive me, Lord, but I see it. The scales are off of my eyes. I know it's there. I see the negative effects of it in my life, and I want to be different. I want to change. This morning, maybe you're holding tightly to an offense. Someone has offended you and the world has told you that you have every right to be offended. You stand there and you hold on to it tightly while Jesus beckons you differently. He says, come on, get lower. Come on, let that go. Get lower. Lay down your right to be right. Be free instead. It is so much better. Would you get lower? The thing about humility is you can't do it on your own. If you think you're going to muster it up yourself, that is a quick way to failure. We don't have that in us. But he can create that in us. His Holy Spirit, he can create something in us that we didn't ever think that we can be. He can do that. I believe that. Do you believe that? Will you ask him to produce that kind of humility in you this morning, the kind of humility that allows you to sell your life out? to Jesus as he increases and you decrease as he becomes greater and you become less y'all will you stand with us as we offer up this final song to the only one who really does deserve our worship if you need to pray this morning this altar is open for you